Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, so welcome to everyone. Uh, if you weren't here yesterday, my name is Christine, and I'm uh, one of the uh, teachers here. I'm going to share my, I hope that's my intro uh, PowerPoint. And let's give it a try. So does that look like something I would have put together with lots of pictures? OK. All right. So the uh, first hour is going to be about snow, and the second hour is going to be about soil moisture. Uh, if you're more interested in um, tides and water levels, uh, that, that'll be the topic for tomorrow. So as I just said, we're going to talk about snow in the first hour. Um, I'm going to call seasonal snow, which is what I have where I, I've been living in Colorado. It's on the ground in the winter and it melts in the summer. And so you have no snow in the summer. So it's distinct from uh, ice sheets where, you know, to me, the ice sheet and, the, you know, it's just always there. It never melts. So uh, we, we uh, saw this problem a little differently depending on which uh, scenario uh, we're working on. And I'm going to separate out uh, ice sheets and have Kelly work on that uh, problem. But both of them are, uh, uh, you know, depending on the reflector height measurement that we talked about yesterday. And that's the primary output of the code. Yesterday, we just, I tried to emphasize how you do measure it. Felipe emphasized why you can measure it. And I tried, I showed you a lot of periodograms and how we were picking out the peak of that periodogram and turning it into the reflector height. Um, but I just wanna throw it out there to you that the amplitude of that retrieval also has information. And, um, you know, it, it's more information is always better. Um, some of the things that makes uh, GNSSI are uh, sort of unique in situ sensor compared to what's available commercially is it measures a relatively large footprint. So those same Fresnel zones that Felipe talked about yesterday and that I showed you primarily for water level measurements are the same Fresnel zones we're using here. And then the other thing that's distinct about what we're talking about today relative to tomorrow is here we're going to almost entirely work, talk about daily averages. So it's not that you couldn't measure sub-daily snow depth. I've just never met anybody who needed it. And uh, it would be extra work for not much, you know, out, great output. Um, all right. So let me just talk about the two kinds of snow. Uh, for snow on ice, um, you know, one of the good things about it is uh, it's very rare to find buildings in Antarctica and Greenland. And um, buildings are bad because they are always, they, they, they interfere with what I wanna do, which is measure the ground, um, the unbuilt environment. Um, the other good thing is because most of these are, you know, on tripods or whatever, the antenna is only two to three meters above the uh, surface usually, you can use the traditional sampling intervals in most archives of 15 to 30 seconds, and that's great. That's gonna be something that's difficult for some of our applications tomorrow where we're trying to measure sea level. Um, the interpretation for ice sheets can be complex. Um, I'm not gonna have Kelly talk about that a lot. She's gonna emphasize more how you compute reflector height. Um, you know, it just depends. Uh, what makes you happy, uh, if the interpretation of the data tells you something interesting about ice sheets, then complexity is good. Uh, for seasonal snow, the complication is there's really four kinds of surfaces, bare soil, bare soil with vegetation, new snow, compacted snow, whereas, you know, snow versus ice, it's all sort of the same thing uh, to us. It, uh, it's, it has relatively similar reflections. I'm not saying they're identical. They're not identical, but after the snow compacts, they're essentially the same. Um, one of the big complaints we had from people that we talked to when we developed this method 10 years ago is they wanted snow water equivalent. They didn't want snow depth. And um, I'm just going to throw it out there that we have a SWE model that's been coded up. 
and it's in MATLAB, and I have it working on individual stations. You wouldn't have to worry about porting it from our original code. If you're willing to port it, I'm happy to put it into this package, but it's not gonna be done by us. So the bad thing about seasonal snow, uh, as opposed to ice sheets is civilization really. Um, so many GNSS sites are put near power and uh, makes it difficult uh, when you're trying to figure out which parts are the built environment and the unbuilt. So, um, I, I, I put this in writing for people that are going to watch this later or read this later. I'm not going to tell the ice sheet people about ice sheets. Um, you guys know way more than I do. Um, I always used to say that the uh, GPS antennas were sinking into the ice sheets, and I was, you know, corrected that they're not sinking. The snow is compacting. So I, I don't want to get into that with you guys. Um, we're gonna show you how to measure the distance between the antenna and the top of the surface. And what you do with that is up to you. It's gonna tell you something about fern density, which we talked about in our first paper, which is shown here um, down below. Uh, really the guiding light of that paper was John Moore. And um, you know he did a great job of explaining it. And part of that story is to remind you that this is a GNSS receiver. So you have access to the vertical coordinates as well as the height of the antenna above the surface. Uh, no um, normal geodesist would want their GNSS receiver to be sinking into a, a surface. So this is unique to the ice sheet people, but you should think about both sources of this data. Uh, after our paper, David Sheen from the University of Washington contacted us, and um, I worked on his data on Pine Island Glacier. Uh, then really just five years, well, maybe six years later, I updated the data set that I worked on with John Moore because originally we'd only had about three years of data, and I think that Kelly said she's going to show you that site, in fact. And I also wanted to point to this uh, paper by the, the Belgian group. They looked at uh, reflections in Antarctica. And then Matt Siegfried uh, also took a really very ancient version of this code that I think was in MATLAB. And uh, he looked at the West Antarctic ice stream and he did, a, he did an accuracy assessment that was pretty um, interesting. So if you're an ice sheet person, read these papers. Uh, for seasonal snow, this is something uh, PBOH2O worked on, and I mentioned that yesterday. It was one of the main products that our group worked on. Uh, Felipe Nowinski worked on the um, topic for his dissertation. And, um, you know, you can look at those old results. Um, but just to, you know, there's no bare soil with an ice sheet. So uh, here, I, we're, we're showing a pretty simple way to measure snow depth by comparing a bare soil reflector height with a reflector height when there's snow on the ground. And uh, we started out uh, in 2009 with that first paper, and then Felipe and I put together some preliminary results, which have some practical um, recommendations for you. Uh, and then really the validation was in this paper that James McRae and Eric Small put together. And you see there, there's SWE. So we did make SWE uh, in situ measurements as well as um, testing out this model we developed. And then uh, I put just one of his two papers, Felipe Nowinski did this for his PhD dissertation and this is his second of the two papers uh, he put together. So does it work? People always ask me if it works. I'll just show you a couple of plots. This is, I think the uh, site that Kelly's gonna be showing you. Uh, this is what they look like uh, when we started um, analyzing the data. The antenna was about three meters or so, maybe a bit more above, uh, quote, not the soil, but the uh, ice sheet. Uh, within about four or five years, the snow was at the level of the antenna. And so they uh, took the antenna off and lengthened it. Uh, this is from that paper that I told you we looked at it again. Um, this is like from 2011 to what is it, 2020, so pandemic days. 
And I, I got GPS IR because it wasn't based entirely on GPS at that time. This is an older receiver type. And then I've got two pingers, uh, basically uh, very small in situ sensors that you can buy in the store, I would say. And, um, and you can see that they agree very well. They're both getting the same long-term uh, trend. And um, even the, the, the sub-dailies are, I mean, or the seasonal uh, variations are quite similar. And I guess the only thing I could say for GPS IR is our data set is completely open. Anyone can produce this data set, whereas those others, I wouldn't say that's true. And then for the seasonal snow, this is one of the sites that uh, Felipe used in his dissertation. Um, I think I have something about this in my presentation. Uh, that poll that I'm plotting, um, pointing out is truth, uh, but it's not the same footprint, mind you, but it is a measure of truth. And then this is a comparison that I put together between the poll and GPS IR using this software. Uh, Felipe did a much more careful job of this in his dissertation um, and, and talks about it in great detail. But I just wanted to give you, you know, usually uh, when I give these talks, first thing people ask is, you know, does it work? And so this is my, yes, it works. So I'm gonna stop there as an introduction and I'm gonna turn this over to Kelly. So she can start um, telling you about ice sheets. She's gonna do an example from Greenland, I believe. And then I'll talk about uh, snow depth in the Western US. Then we'll take a break and then it'll be soil moisture. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. I'm assuming we can see this. Great. So um, station GLS-1 was installed at Die 2 on the Greenland ice sheet in 2011. Uh, the antenna is mounted on a long pole, um, and about 3.5 meters of the pole was above the ice at the time of installation. So this receiver at the site only consists or consistently tracks legacy GPS signals, so we're going to use L1 for our analysis. Um, I'm showing you through a Jupyter notebook here. So at the beginning of every Jupyter notebook, we start with our imports. This allows us to be able to run the code. Great. So GLS-1 was originally installed with an elevation mask of seven degrees. So uh, to keep that in mind for our analysis, we're going to use seven degrees as the minimum elevation angle for our analysis later. Um, and even though the managers did later change uh, to enable this site to track L2C, we are still going to just stick with L1 for this example. So here I've put in an example of the web app that Christine showed yesterday, since this is one of the cases that you can see there. Uh, so if you wanted to, you could check out this site here. You can do it in the notebook or in a browser as well. All right, so our ultimate goal in this use case is to analyze one year of data. We're going to choose the year 2012 because there was a large melt event on the ice sheet. Um, we always start with quick look. Uh, we're going to look at one day in order to then properly set our quality control parameters. So here I've set our variables since we're using station GLS-1 for the rest of the notebook. I set that here. We're looking at the year 2012. And just for this quick look, we're going to look at the day of year 100. So the next thing we do is we run our Rhinex to SNR with the required parameters being station year and day of year. Hi, uh, Kelly, just a quick comment. I don't know if it's possible, but somebody asked if you could make, I guess, the text bigger, but I, I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, let me see if I can zoom in. Okay. Is that a little better? It might cut off some though. But it's okay, I just letting you know what someone said. Yeah, sure, thank you. Hopefully that's a little bit better. I can't zoom in without losing some of the uh, text. Great, okay. So um, while we're doing quick look, uh, just as a note with the notebooks, you can look at our documentation either on our read the docs 
You can also add a question mark after one of our functions to remind yourself. So if I didn't remember what the minimum uh, elevation angle parameter looks like, I can always run this cell and then we can see what these parameters are. And this is exactly what you'll see in the documentation as well on Read the Docs. So now we're gonna run our, our quick look. And so this is gonna print out these plots that Christine has showed several times. So um, we are immediately seeing some good peaks here at around the reflector height of maybe 2.5 meters. Um, we see that the retrieved reflector heights are pretty consistent on most azimuths here. The retrievals for the azimuth range between 340 and maybe 40 degrees are marked as not having met our quality control settings. So perhaps we can remove these for our analysis so you can kind of see how to do that. Though the code does look to be properly marking those as bad since there are no good retrievals in that area. Um, this is actually more related to the GPS satellite inclination than local conditions at GLS-1 since they're directly north. So we can see also that the peak to noise um, QC metric of three looks to be pretty reasonable. So we'll remind ourselves of that when we're adding that to our make JSON later, as well as the amplitude. It looks like maybe we could set eight as an acceptable minimum value. All right, so we're now gonna go through and we're gonna measure snow accumulation for the whole year of 2012. So in this case, we would be running right next to SNR. There's a new parameter here, which is the day of year end. We're setting that to the end of the year. I am not gonna run this because it can take some time. I have run it ahead of time so we can still continue with the notebook, but this is what it would look like to do that. So um, we are going to use the default min and max reflector height uh, for our make JSON, um, but from our decisions using Quick Look and the knowledge of the station itself, we'll remind ourselves that we're gonna use the elevation angle of seven degrees. We're gonna to specify to use L1, our peak to noise and our minimum amplitude, we're going to set to three and eight. And then the required parameters for make JSON, of course, is the station and then the lat long and the height. Make sure to include that. So uh, to change our azimuth angles, this is where we will hand edit our JSON file. So on the command line, you would then open the file and edit it. But in the notebooks, we'll use Python to edit this file. So um, just to, I'm just gonna, I, so we no longer require hand editing. Uh, you can put the azimuths online now. Great. We're, get, we're catching up with you. We're slow, but we're, yeah. <laughs> we're catching up with you. <laughs> Um, so uh, in the notebooks, at least, we can change this right here. And so we are changing the value that's called asval. So from here, I'm getting rid of actually maybe 330 to 40. And then we can print out what the make JSON or what our JSON file looks like. And so here we can see all of the parameters that we're setting that we're going to pass to GNSSIR. All right, so now um, that we have our SNR files and our JSON inputs, we're gonna go ahead and estimate the reflector heights for the whole year of 2012. So this is where we would run our GNSSIR at the required station year, day of year. We're setting our day of end again to the end of the year. In this case, I'm also not gonna run this since it does print out. Uh, it takes a little while to run, so I've done this ahead of time. Uh, you can include uh, more screen statistics, which I think Christine mentioned yesterday about if you want more information on what's happening while this is running. I've set that to false for, um, so it doesn't fill up a bunch of the screen, but you're welcome to set it to true when you're running this. Um, so then after we've done that, we'll then use our daily average tool to compute the daily, sorry, the daily average reflector heights. Um, so in this case, for our daily average tool, we're going to set the median filter to 0 0.25 meters, and we're just going to make 30 individual tracks required in order to recover a daily average. So this is going to print out four plots, the first plot being all of the reflector heights for the station over the period that we requested. The second one is our daily mean reflector height. 
The third is the daily mean reflection amplitude. And the last one being the number of values used in the daily average. So you'll see at the top, it also prints out exactly where all of these files and information are stored. So you can always find them and use that data. And um, in this case is what we're more interested in at the moment. And this is showing that large melt event in the summer that we are expecting to see. And that's, that's, that's this uh, use case. That was beautifully done. It's so nice to see it. <laughs> um, these, uh, uh, when we started a few years ago, it was <laughs> is, uh, amazing that we can put these all in the notebook so that you can get everything together at one place. So I'm gonna, um, just gonna keep charging ahead so we can keep our break and we'll add, add, we'll have the questions at the end and, and you can ask questions of Kelly at the same time you're ask, asking questions of me. So let me try to share my screen. Uh, so I think this is it, let's check it out. Seasonal snow. So seasonal snow, um, all right, let's see what I said. Uh, I'm going to start out with uh, a case that I did yesterday. I know it's not the most exciting case, but it's one that's pretty flat. And we already looked at it yesterday, so I don't have to go through the quick look plots and so on. Um, this is uh, Boulder, Colorado, just south of Boulder. And these were my quick look. You know, in fact, I think it's the same exact day or similar. Uh, this is a day before it snowed, and you see there's this nice blue line of retrievals of about two meters. Uh, the peak to noise, val noise values are very large, six. And this is after it snows. So this is day 74, this is day 72. So I just wanted to show you what the size of the signal is. It's, you know, 30, 40 centimeters. That's a pretty, pretty big uh, snowstorm for Boulder. But you also see, just showing this to you, this, uh, we had good retrievals up in the north before, but those kind of fell apart after the snowstorm. So uh, just as a you know reminder that snow is not as flat as uh, soil. So this was before it snowed. We had everything at the same value. After it snowed, things were more complicated. The snow was not a beautiful flat layer. Um, so how are we gonna do this? Basically, how do I do the same thing that uh, Kelly just did in the notebooks? Uh, so this is how you do it in the Docker or how you would do it um, uh, if you were uh, using the command line. You want to do a whole year of data. Um, in this case, uh, I'm saying I want to do multi-GNSS. And I start sometime in the summer or late, uh, early fall in the year 2020. And I'm going to go through day of year 150 of the next year. Uh, as with Kelly, I'm going to start with the defaults. Um, and then I run GNSSIR. I mean, it's really how easy it is. Now, this happens to be GPS only, but it's really pretty straightforward for simple sites. Um, so the daily average, I'm going to use very similar values as Kelly, 0 0.2 meters, um, 20 values. These are just starting points. Um, why do I use a median filter? because I don't want to deal with this crap down here in red. This happens to be a year of data for uh, a site in Greenland. It's called uh, Summit Camp. And the actual reflector is here at 13 meters. Uh, this stuff, I could talk to you about it, but I don't want I don't have time today. It's not the primary retrieval. And I don't want it getting into my average. So the median's always going to be here. And then I can set how far I want to allow those values to go. And I don't have to worry about using more robust statistics. So that's what I'm going to use here. Again, I have these statistics that show you how many retrievals. So 20 is ridiculous because there's you know, over 130 most times. Um, this is all the reflector heights. Now, this stuff here at the bottom, if I used a you know, tighter constraint, I could get that to go away. And then this is the daily average. Uh, some of you who are here really for soil moisture might be getting a little excited by these, uh, what are look very much like dry downs. And that is what you're seeing. This is the effects from precipitation and soil moisture changes 
So that does show up in the reflector heights, but here we're really only trying to understand snow depth. And so the y-axis here is reflector height, starts out you know, close to two meters. This is the big snowstorm on day 70, whatever it was, 74. Um, so it's complicated. We've got snow in the fall and in the early spring, we've got snow. We're trying to separate these things. Um, what else do we have going on? Oh, yeah, I don't mean to complain, but we've got vegetation growing. That's what happens in Boulder in the spring is everything's green and you start having effects from the vegetation. So our goal is to try and come up with an algorithm that can deal with all that. So the way we have used uh, our algorithm is very simple. We just have something called a bare soil reflector height value that's before the snow started falling. And uh, the, we compute reflector height throughout the water year. I apologize for using a North American water year. So we're talking about the fall and uh, the next six months. The default, it uses September to set the bare soil. Um, I'm happy to add a Southern Hemisphere water year option to this code. We have the latitude of the site, so we, it'd be easy to do that automatically, but we need some coding help. I've got two options for how you do the bare soil one or the retrievals. One is brute force, just all retrievals together. Another one uses averages every 20 degrees of azimuth. And that would be appropriate for helping you to look at multi-GNSS. I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, but here's how you would compute snow depth. Again, we've tried to keep it as simple as possible for the number of inputs, just the station name and the water year. So this is not the calendar year, this is the water year. And the water year starts the fall 2020 and goes through the spring 2021. This uses the daily average results, or if you don't wanna to have to do the daily average uh, uh, results again, you can just set the same two parameters here and the code knows to go do it for you. And this is what it ends up looking like. Um, my only uh, thing I would say is I, I do think I ended up zeroing out anything that was below five centimeters because our general uh, feeling is that we're not very accurate at distinguishing between you know, two centimeters of snow and zero centimeters of snow. So our, uh, when we gave out results, we always put in the header, we don't, we don't trust our results below five centimeters, so we don't report them. Um, but this is this big uh, snowstorm. Big is a relative term. 40 centimeters isn't that big, but that's what you see for Boulder, Colorado. Um, uh, the snow depth for Niwot Ridge is, I'm just going to show you some um, results. I'm not going to show you how I did it, really. But I do just want to point out to you that that pole is the current technology being used at Niwot Ridge to measure snow depth. So, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to uh, see that still, but they, the value of that site is they've been measuring it for decades. Uh, the GPS antenna here is more than three meters tall. I think that's because Felipe got the data from the poles and looked at it for 20, 30 years and uh, that's why we made it so tall is even though it doesn't usually get near that antenna, it can. Um, so the uh, details for how I analyze this data are in a use case. Uh, I wanted to just say there is a snow tail site at Niwot Ridge. This is a long-term ecological research station in the United States. Uh, so it does have a snow tail site, which is the U.S. government's uh, network. Uh, there's no issue with getting the good L2C data because it was my site. Uh, there are no L5 data or GLONASS or Galileo. So what we're going to do is we're going to run RhinX SNR and GNSS IR, and then we're just going to look at some water year results. Um, here's the first year. I think we put it in just before the snow fell in September 2009. Um, so again, these are daily averages with an uncertainty. Uh, peak here maybe got to 
over a little bit over a meter, 1.2 meters. I wanted to point out here that this is very, I mean, it could be snow, but this right here at the end, I bet that's vegetation growing. And I wanna you know, admit that to you, uh, that that's an issue. In the summer, the vegetation can be misinterpreted as snow. Uh, this was the next year. Uh, do you see how, you know, previous peak was like 1.1 meters. The next year, it was pretty close to the antenna. Um, uh, but also, our default of ending the plots in the time series is not uh, appropriate. Uh, ending in June 30th isn't going to work. Uh, so, um, I, but it, I've, I've added um, an option that you can tell the code, no, no, this is snow, so don't turn it off. In this case, I tell it to stop at the end of um, July. But again, I would say, I've circled it here, that's vegetation, I would bet. Um, and again, here was the, I already showed this to you. Uh, this is a manual. This is a pole that at least is close to the GPS receiver. They're not the same footprint, but it's close. Um, but I have seen too many times where people compare to Snowtel uh, and it's just not appropriate. And here is a picture that no USDA says is the snow tail site at Nyrat Ridge. It might not be, but at least that's what it said. And you can see that this sensor is surrounded by trees. Our sensor, there ain't, there's no trees whatsoever, okay? Uh, so those are different conditions and you wouldn't expect the snow depth time series to be the same. One is gonna have wind, you can see wind effects even in the snow. And then um, the other issue um, is they're not in the same place. I know that a lot of people think they're co-located because they're only a few kilometers apart, um, but that just isn't good enough when you're trying to assess accuracy. So it can be very hard to understand, you know, where to do accuracy. It can be very hard to do accuracy, but, um, Here's an example of where you can't do it with existing uh, in situ data. All right, so um, could somebody tell me what time it is? Because I don't have my watch. 9.33. Oh, okay, all right. So I'm going, I'll have plenty of time for questions, which is good. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite sites. Uh, it's in Utah. It's a site that we analyzed for a long time in PBOH2O. If you want to see those uh, results, you can, I put the address there. Um, okay, this is me being annoyed, but uh, it's a good site, but it can sometimes be hard to tell uh, what, what's going on at the site. Um, and the reason I bring this up, and we'll talk about it on Friday, when I talk about the good data, I really mean the L2C data. And at this site, to get that data, you have to download the one second data and decimate it. And um, that can be, it's pretty fast, particularly because UNAVCO has good one second files, but it is, you have to know it's there. And um, this all changed here in 2021 when they put a new receiver in there. And now you get the good data in uh, all the files and it's 15 second and it's great. So what I thought I'd do is I'd combine our past work and look at basically the last two years. So the 2022 snow year and the 2023 snow year. Um, so again, it's not hard to uh, translate the data. Uh, I put this on here for you to show you how to get the good data from the past. Um, again, I'm just asking for data from sort of in the summer, late summer to the end of June. I think that's right, five times, oh no, that's the end of May, I guess. And then all you have to do, you should specify your NAVCO as the archive, that you want the high rate data, but you wanna decimate it because you don't need one second data to look at this uh, reflector height of two or three meters. You should run quick look um, at this particular site. I decided that the best reflections were this azimuth range of about 120 to about 310 or something like that. Um, so exactly what Kelly talked about 
for doing for an ice sheet. And uh, what am I doing here? Okay, then I define my strategy. Uh, P101, I think I talked about this yesterday. I, uh, I have a big database of GPS stations that you know, University of Nevada Reno provided to us. So if your station is there, you can just put 000, zero, zero there. Uh, I'm specifying that azimuth list. And I'm also specifying the frequently li frequency list. And one is L1 and 20 is L2C. Um, this is a, not a complaint about the um, multi-GNSS. The multi-GNSS signals are great, but they just didn't exist when this um, station was installed and operated. And this receiver wasn't tracking things at that time with multi-GNSS. So then we just go ahead and use the defaults for the rest. We estimate reflector height and we consolidate it by running daily average. Uh, we get something that looks like this. Um, again, uh, I'm not showing you snow depth. I'm showing you reflector height. And you'll notice that I very often plot reflector height backwards. Right, so big reflector heights are at the bottom, smaller reflector heights are at the top, and that's just because no one likes to look at upside down tides and no one wants to look at upside down snow depth. Uh, so this thing, when I was talking about compaction, that's what this, these, this curvature is. Um, but basically, it starts snowing in the, um, in this case, the first snowstorms are in December, you know, peak snow is in the middle of January, and then it melts, basically, it melts all in March and early April. Um, that's from the early receiver. Um, I, I turned that into snow depth by just using the simple model because I just had the two frequencies. I didn't want to have to rerun uh, daily average, so I put that on the command line. And again, this is 2017 is the North American water year that starts in the fall 2016 and goes through 2017. So, I just thought it would be fun. That was an example from the past. Let's look at the last few years. And again, this is because UNAVCO's uh, recently put a nice new receiver there. And um, I've actually updated this up until yesterday. So uh, the day of year end is actually not accurate anymore. But here, I'm not having to download the high rate data. I am using the rapid orbits, which are multi-GNSS. I'm still getting the data from UNAVCO. I could also get the data from SOPEC. As to why I don't compute files for the summer is because I don't care about the summer when I'm trying to measure snow. I added more frequencies, so you can see I'm using GLONASS as well as Galileo, and um, good to go. All right, uh, so this is what, uh, this is what? This is the snow year 2022 water year. Uh, Peak snow depth is about 0.7, so 70 centimeters. Um, this is this is as of yesterday, uh, much, much more snow, uh, 1.2 meters. And you can see that it's melting off very quickly. Um, how fast that melts is just gonna depend on the temperature in, in Utah. Um, and then this is what I did. I, I, I gave you that uh, link to the PBOH 2 results. We started that time series in 2011, which is when uh, they started tracking L2C. And what is that? One, two, three, four, five. Look at that year, nothing. Six, seven, eight. So we did eight years. Um, that's about when I retired in 2018. And the uh, network was, um, we gave our code to JPL. So they don't have any posted results, but I went ahead and for this class added 2022 and 2023. So um, at least when I talk to snow people, it depends which snow people you're talking to, but they generally want to know how much it's snowing this year relative to past years. I mean, it, it depends. If they want to know how much snow melt there's going to be, that's a different problem. But having these climate records of decades, uh, I think, is the most valuable to the most people. Um, this was another favorite site uh, that this is one of Felipe's sites as well. This is the 2022. This is in Idaho, 60 centimeter peak. And then this year it was 1.2 meters. 
And you can see that one is definitely taken off and melted quite quickly. I have absolutely no idea how hot it was in uh, Idaho in April, but it certainly just to a non-expert looks like it's been melting off or it melted off quite quickly there. Um, and then I just thought for fun, I would show you what happens uh, when your antenna is buried. Um, these are positions. So that's not why you're in this class. You're in this class to learn how to use reflections. You cannot use our code if the site is buried. You can do things with the data, but you can't do it with our code. But uh, when that site becomes buried, and this is in California, look at these positions, you know, uh, they go crazy. So this is um, a bad thing. That's all I'm gonna say. So one of the uh, jobs of uh, station coordinator, coordinators is that they have to figure out a way to uh, correct or uh, clean those data. Um, did I unshare? I meant to unshare. Did I? Okay, yay. All right, so, oh good. So I didn't talk too much, that's great. We have time for questions and um, why don't I just put Tim in charge of reading your questions to me and Kelly, if there are any. And if there aren't, we'll take a break. Um, yeah, there's, there's a, quite a few questions, but I can just start at least with a couple and we'll see how we're doing on time. Does that sound, sound good? Yeah, yeah. Why don't so we try to go to 5.50 and then we'll stop and take 10 minutes. There was quite a few questions that are related to how you account for slope. I don't. Felipe, would you like to chime in? <laughs> well, um, when I run, uh, I try to remove the slope by sort of doing like we do with the soil moisture which is taking the summer heights, the medium yeah. summer heights, and then subtract that, but not, not across the entire site, but for specific uh, tracks. And that's only easy to do in GPS because the azimuth repeats, Yeah. but it's, it's a lot more complicated for uh, GLONASS and Galileo, et cetera. I mean, there's um, if you go back and look at the paper that Felipe and I wrote in, I think it's 2012, we do talk about how big the effect would be for various slope values. And, um, you know, the bigger the slope, it's a bigger problem, right, Felipe? So. Yeah, yeah. In, in that paper, we have, we, we have a plot that is often misunderstood misunderstood True. which is the, the residual effect of the slope but the, the slope the direct the primary effect of slope is huge it can be like tens of centimeters so yeah try try to narrow your azimuth mask to exclude, exclude. The yeah regions and and you're probably good to go i mean a lot of it had to do with you know it's that slope how big is that slope in your smaller area, right? I mean, you, like Felipe said, you can try to avoid, uh, he showed a, a plot, it was actually Niwot Ridge yesterday, and it was obstructing the, it, it was a very significant slope off the, you know, the Northwest slope of Niwot Ridge. So we didn't use that slope, right? We got reflections from it, but we didn't use it. But yeah, it, it's uh, tricky. It can be tricky, and I would welcome people working on the problem to make it more automated to, to remove effects from slope. Uh, we did very little to correct for it. Uh, we, made in, we made accuracy measurements by you know, paying somebody to go uh, measure snow depth, and we found that, at least for the sites we were looking at, which were PBO sites, it was not a huge error. But it doesn't mean it's zero. And I think that's valid to look at it some more. Yeah, th th that will show up if if uh, somebody tries to do sub daily uh, snow mm -hmm. depth retrievals. If you do, if you stick with daily, then you are probably safe because it sort of averages out. 
but 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 then if you do hourly, then you oh, certainly yeah. going to see ups and downs just because you're sampling downhill or uphill. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I and I, I mean, I and this is a maybe a small thing, but you know, we would see variability. I mean, we still computed a daily average, but we had the values for the different azimuths. I mean, we had them in files. We didn't give them to people, but um, sometimes, we, you know, within our group, there would be complaints, not from Felipe, but other complaints. Well, it turns out some of our sites had north facing slopes. And those don't have the same snow depth values as the south facing slopes. So, what we were actually measuring in that case was correct. But it does make the daily average appear to be noisier because the actual snow depth values are, in fact, different for the different slopes. And, um, you know, it, it is complicated or can be. Um, there was a few questions sort of similarly related along the lines of um, how much does the signal penetrate into the snow? Does this need to be corrected and or um, does this tell you something about this, the nature of the snow? I'm going to let Felipe do that. He's the expert on snow. Sure. Um, so the, the primary reflection is from the top air snow interface. It does penetrate, but then it, it eventually gets killed by the internal uh, impurities in the snow. Uh, I mean, remember from uh, yesterday, coherence is, is very important for us. And as the radio wave propagates down into the snowpack and bounces from the ground and backs up, it, it's, it's getting less and less coherent. So even if we get reflections from the bottom, they are not going to generate the interference pattern that's the main observable. So that's sort of filters out the, the shallow reflections. We, so bottom line is the top reflection is the strongest one, at least in a coherent manner. And that's what we are, we are sensing. I mean, I, th I think that the other thing is, I, th I think if you want to look at attenuation through the snow, you really need to do the other way, which is to bury your antenna. And, and then you're directly measuring attenuation. You're not looking at the reflection, you're seeing the attenuation. And there are yeah, papers on, on it. That's a different thing. Hmm. Yeah, burying an antenna is the proper way of doing snow um, density, for example. And, and also remember, we are, we are restricted to uh, grazing incidents, so very small elevation angles. Uh, if you have now a, a different antenna that allows you to look at near normal incidents, then you're going to see some more penetration. But at near grazing, it's mostly off the top. I think that's another thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll probably just stop us. But um, sometimes the, I don't know how many of the people in the audience are, uh, have looked at this problem on ice sheets. And, you know, there are problems with radars uh, penetrating differently depending on whether the snow at the top is wet or dry. And so the penetration depths are quite different for a radar and Felipe could tell you why that is in equations, but that's what he just said is the key factor. We're not at the same angles. We're a radar. So I guess we can go ahead and get started, do you think? I think we're okay. All right. Um, so let me try. I tried answering some questions. Those were good questions that people have posted. Um, a lot of interest in, well, slopes, as you said, and um, no water equivalent. Uh, let me see, share screen. There we go. Uh, so I haven't given this talk before, so I hope it goes okay. 
Um, I've kind of gotten out of this soil moisture business. Um, so let me start out uh, by thanking a bunch of people that worked on this project, uh, like so many people, um, because um, some of these people were our snow experts, but they were also our snow soil moisture experts, because you really had to keep track of both things to do a good soil moisture records. Um, the PIs were the four of us on the left, uh, that's Valerie Zavarotny, myself, Eric Small, and John Brown. Um, and this is our little PBO H2O logo. Um, so I found this old slide, uh, the cartoon version of GNSSIR uh, was that, you know, bare soil produces this nice curve here uh, in black. And if you add a snow layer, as Felipe said, you reflect off the um, top and people are asking, well, how do we get snow depth? Well, we how do I get bare soil? Well, we use the fall measurements when we assume there's no snow to give us the bare soil. The difference of these two values of reflector height gives you snow depth. Um, the code no longer does uh, vegetation. We did a vegetation product as well. Um, but essentially vegetation causes an amplitude, it causes an attenuation, but causes the amplitude of the periodogram to go down. Um, and I've drawn this cartoon in a way that makes really vegetation and snow look like they're pretty easy to see. And they are comparatively. And I've, the soil wet, I mean, it is the hardest thing to measure with GNSSIR. Soil moisture is by far. So if you're interested in soil moisture, you have to uh, be really careful and you won't see any sites surrounded by trees. You won't see any sites with significant terrain. Uh, you want your flattest sites. You want these coherent reflections. And, um, you know, honestly, we set up our validation sites to break the method. And the way you break the method is putting them in a farmer's field and growing alfalfa around your GPS antenna. So yes, you can make it very difficult to measure um, soil moisture in the presence of vegetation. And it was really only thanks to uh, our modeling experts, Valerie Zavarotny and, and Clara Chu, that we had any hope of measuring soil moisture in the presence of vegetation. So I'm just going to start out, um, instead of doing the straight straightforward periodogram, uh, the effects of soil moisture are so small, so small, that we're not gonna do the periodogram effect. Now, I showed you a time series for Boulder, Colorado, where it sure looked like we should have been able to measure snow, uh, sorry, soil moisture with reflector height changes. And you're right, we can. And pretty much only in Boulder or only in certain, uh, certain places, maybe 10 or 20% of the sites showed such good dry downs that we got pretty consistent uh, uh, correlations between reflector heights and soil moistures. And we wrote a whole paper on it, but you know, it was just not as sensitive as phase. And that's just the end of that story is uh, when we did, we noticed that phase, and I'm showing this as my phase parameter here, that we throw out when we measure snow depth, it turned out to be incredibly sensitive to soil moisture. And when I say soil moisture, I mean in the top five centimeters. I don't mean deep. I don't mean semi-deep. I mean super shallow within five centimeters. So um, we originally didn't know why phase was so sensitive to this. Um, in fact, we didn't think it would be sensitive. And our first study, we fixed H, which is the reflector height. And this is the same equation that drives everything Felipe talked about and drives snow depth estimation. And we were just gonna estimate the changes in soil moisture by looking at the amplitude A, because that's what we thought would be the simplest way to see soil moisture. We thought the reflectance, the dielectric constant would be different for wet soil. So surely we would see what we wanted to see in the, the parameter A, 
And the way you do this in least squares is you estimate phase in A. Uh, we weren't planning to look at phase at all. But when we did plot that against soil moisture sensors that we'd actually buried in the ground, so no modeling, just like actual in situ sensors, which I've plotted here on the x-axis. Uh, phase here, which is negative, but that doesn't matter. For this satellite, satellite 29, um, and this was like, I don't remember, it was, it was, I think it was three months of data. So there are 90 points here. Uh, the phase values from this estimate varied by about 35 degrees. And it looked pretty darn linear. Okay, now it didn't look linear here. So it looks like we have a not as easy time measuring the difference between 0.05 and 0.1 volumetric water content. And I think that is still a problem. We have a hard time distinguishing between those two. But I don't think you would argue that there isn't a pretty nice linear relationship between measured in situ buried sensors with phase in the GPS. Um, and that was our first result. First result. And uh, when we wrote the paper, uh, we took those in situ sensors and we plotted their variation in gray. And that's what's shown here. Is uh, so they didn't all agree with each other either, but they all went up when it rained, and so rain is shown here on the y axis on the right side in blue. And this is our you know how much it rained on each day, and uh, the colors gosh, you must think I'm obsessed with colors, but I like colors. So each satellite got a color, and at that time, there were only six satellites transmitting the good signals. And they're now 24. So that's how old I am. So uh, we just applied a, a, a scaling parameter. We didn't have any model that told us how to go from phase to volumetric water content. All right. So that was our first result. And the correlation was like 0.9. And those circles, we had one per day, but they were different times of the day. And they didn't agree perfectly. You can see there's a spread. Um, but you know, there's a spread in the gray, which were the so-called truth measurements. So uh, after that first result, which was just pure, uh, I'm not gonna say luck, but just amazing that it worked, um, our experts set out to develop better models. Valery Zarotny developed a bare soil model. Uh, he worked with Eric Small and Clara Chu to uh, build better models to correct the vegetation effects. And that was her PhD uh, dissertation. And I'm just, I'm not going to talk about it in detail. I would simply say here in blue, she's shown on the upper left plot, she's showing observations and she can model those bare soil uh, variations very well. And here it's sign of elevation angle and our power value. And here she's showing below what those reflector heights look like. But that's bare soil. Um, look at on the so top right. Well, it's actually the middle, but you see it has blue and green, so it's blue and red and black. So she's got observed SNR data. She's got two different models and um, yeah, vegetation wet weight. I, I assume there are some people uh, at this school that know about vegetation modeling and so on, but that's how much the vegetation weighs in, in, with water in it. I think that's right. It's been a long time. but And you can see that those two uh, plots don't look at all the same, right? I mean, there's this kink here and Sure, at the higher elevations, things look simple. And to be honest, they don't look like this at all, where I said add vegetation. I made it look like vegetation would just sort of monotonically de decline. And, that, and that's not the case. Um, and that's where uh, Clara and Valeri really 
made a contribution because they were able to show how to take amplitude changes and reflector height changes and correct the phase measurements for the effects of vegetation. Um, so how does that relate to the GNSS reflections code? Um, we're still using the same SNR data. Um, the code we used for PBO H2O was in Fortran. We've just converted it to Python. Uh, we uh, are using the same kind of translation code. That's di no different. We exclusively use L2C data. Um, that's what we used for Clara's dissertation. Um, and one of the th reasons we're doing that is because it's easier. The GPS orbits are in an orbital path that allows them to cover the, the, the reflections are on the same part of the ground every day. They're just four minutes earlier each day. And that's very powerful because it means any slope errors cancel, really. And we don't even use sites that aren't flat. And um, it just makes our life a lot easier if we know that we're going over the same soil path. Um, so can you use other signals? Absolutely. Um, but not with this software. What we agreed to do to, for our, to our sponsors, we said, we'll take our existing algorithm that we've tested in which we have published papers that we can tell you how accurate it is. We can tell you how precise it is. We know where it works and we know where it doesn't work. We did not propose to do new research on Galileo or GLONASS. So how does this relate to the code I talked to you about yesterday? Well, we still need to know that reflector height because we're gonna use that information in a couple ways. One is because it's directly in our model. Um, the second thing is that the amplitudes are gonna tell us about vegetation. So we want those. Um, we need a good azimuth mask. So we're gonna use quick look uh, and we need some new code. So we need to estimate phase and the code's called phase, which is probably not a great name for it, but that's what it's called. But once we have those phase estimates, we're gonna have to change it to something that matters to um, a hydrologist. Uh, it has to be in the right unit. So that's gonna use the models that Valeria and Clara developed. So there's new code. Um, so something, I, I wrote this out so people that aren't on this particular call but are reading it can understand. I think reflector heights are easier to explain. I'm measuring the vertical distance between the antenna phase center and the su surface, the reflection surface. Now it could be snow, it could be soil, it can be water. Is there penetration? Yes, but we have an idea of how much that penetration is. So we understand there are biases, but it's an absolute measurement that we can like look at it and have a good idea of what it means. Phase is not. It's a relative measurement. You cannot take the phase estimated from this code and say the soil has a volumetric water content of a certain value. And I will just remind you, these phase values are 235 to 265. That, that doesn't tell you anything about volumetric water content. It does tell you that it was very, it was linearly related to volumetric water content. So if we can get the scaling parameter, and set everything to zero at some point, we'll have a pretty good sensor. Um, and that's in the and that's in fact what we ended up doing. So uh, we can give you a good time series for VWC changes. We have a, a method that we developed for PBO H2O. You are welcome to vary how you apply certain um, parameters. You don't have to use our method, uh, but we did not have the money to send people to 150 sites to calibrate them every year. So uh, we leveled our changes, if you will, using if an in-situ measurement if we had it, but we would also use uh, pick a dry time of the year. And we used, I, I think there was a soil texture value that we used to level it. Um, so I'm gonna today show you the simple model. 
Uh, we used it at 95% of our sites. Well, that's not even right. 98% of our sites. Um, Clara developed a more advanced model that we needed for sites that had a lot of vegetation. And I'm happy to let you have it. Um, just you need to port it to Python. So this would be sort of your prototype, great site. Um, no trees. Trees are bad for reflectometry. Uh, we had good success in shrublands, grasslands, and savannas. But we didn't have any good soil moisture sites in forests. Um, so there you go. Uh, how do you do this in the code? Well, as I said, we're going to use the same uh, modules. We're going to translate the data. We're going to use Quick Look. We're going to use make JSON input. We're going to make more SNR files. And then we're going to run GNSSIR for, I think you should use at least six months. I'm going to show you a year. Um, can you do less? Of course you can. Of course you can. But I, I like to trust a site before I send it to the world. So again, this is one of these sites where uh, the good data were only in the one second data stream. Uh, but UNAFCO was kind enough to uh, put it in um, a special archive for us so that we could use it in this class and so that you guys could have a, a sample site. So you specify archive special. Don't specify UNAFCO. Special, the, the correct archive name is special. And we're using the L2C frequency. I guess I wrote a little note here just to tell you that if you want to look at data from other sites and you want the L2C data and it's not there, do not be shy. Ask them for it. They will get it for you. I have never had a bad experience once with UNAVCO about getting data sets. Uh, they've always been very open to uh, providing the data. They have it somewhere. It's just not online. Um, so this is what Quick Look looks like. I love this site. I love these data. You see the gray, occasionally you see these funky gray, you know, periodograms. These are just tracks that didn't have enough data or they only, they didn't get up to 25 degrees elevation angle, things like that. So they're not, uh, it's not a bad site. It's just uh, the, the periodogram didn't have enough data to get a good reflector height. Uh, this is the, uh, you know, the azimuth. Now, again, this is 2017 when there weren't as many satellites, um, you'd have more today. Um, this is a, a PBO site, so the Nevada database knows where it is, so I don't even have to tell it. I'm gonna tell it I wanna use L2C. I'm gonna um, estimate reflector height for an entire year. And then this is the new code. I need to tell the code a list of satellite tracks. Um, you could say, well, don't you already have that from before, and sure, I guess you could say that, but I want to have a list of, I want to have a good list. I don't want to mix up satellite tracks that only had 20 measurements with satellite tracks that had 350 measurements. Um, and this is what it might look like. Um, in this particular case, the first column is just, you know, one through 40. Um, we had sites with only 10 tracks. So 40 is great. Um, uh, second column is reflector height, the satellite numbers, the third column, the azimuth, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see at this site, there are 350 measurements uh, per year, which means it, you know there were occasional data outages, but basically things were quite good. Um, so again, we're gonna estimate phase using those for those tracks. It's much faster than the periodogram tracks, sorry, periodogram code. And that's just because it's estimating two parameters with least squares. And then you run the VWC code, um, which I have here. So there's only two parameters, station name and the year. Now, if you had two years, you could say day, you know, year end 2018 or something, right? Excuse me. Um, this is what comes out of it. Uh, I happen to plot it by track, not because I have this great love of tracks or sorry, quadrants. It's just a reality check. Are all the bad data coming from certain quadrants? Because let's get rid of that quadrant. Um, 
in particular? Do you see this gray here in the northwest track? I mean, that that's kind of sticking out, uh, kind of makes me suspicious. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, do you remember like way back when, let's go back when, uh, this was the phase values, you know, it was like 235 to 265. Uh, th this, these phase results, everything's starting at about zero. And that's what the code has done. It's taken out uh, uh, basically a zero value. It's really the bottom 5% of the data so that we can use these crazy phase data. These phase data were never meant to use to measure soil moisture, but they do a pretty good job of it. Um, all right. I would never expect you to go looking for the gray satellite to throw it out, um, but the code sends some statistics to you and it tells you there's a residual, an RMS of, you know, a residual that's almost eight degrees of phase. Consider removing that track. Um, this is being generated by, I think the default is like five to six degrees residual. So if you change this to look for things that were bigger than seven, it would automatically be um, removed. And where is that happening? I guess I don't show that, apologies. I'll show you in the next example that this can be automatically removed by the code. So I'm not gonna show it here. Uh, but this is what the daily phase results look like in phase. So this is phase. Um, and then we apply the vegetation model of chew it all and zero it out. And this is what it looks like. These are daily values. Um, could you do sub-daily? Absolutely. We did sub-daily for uh, PBOH2O. Um, you know, we just split it in half. We did one... Uh, an average for the first 12 hours of the day, and the other one was the second 12 hours of the day. I will say though, it will not be local time. I, everything in this code is in UTC. Absolutely every single thing, not even UTC, it's GPS time, which is GPS time with, uh, without leap seconds. Uh, so this is an example of, um, for a site in New Mexico, I think it is. And then I, I just to show you that, you know, it you can do this for more than one year. This is a four-year time series. I think we had a series that started in 2011. So I went back and redid that. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody from Australia is here. So this is a site somewhere in Queensland. Um, there's a use case, and I, I think Kelly's got a Jupyter notebook for it. Um, I've also got a use case. And we did two years then, but I thought, well, let's just test out the code more recently. Um, we use the same code. Um, and in this case, I, I haven't shown this before, but I'm using the RINEX3 format. Why? because that's an easy way to get the good L2C data. You can get it at either the archive at CDDIS, which is a NASA archive or the Geoscience Australia. I would tell you to use whichever archive is faster for you. If you're in Australia, it will be faster to use GA. If you're in the United States, it'll be faster to use CDDIS. I'm gonna analyze two years of data. Um, you'll also notice that RINEX3 has much longer station names. It has the same four station characters. I don't even remember why it has two zeros. And then they have station codes. And um, that's been a problem. Uh, the whole four character thing has been a problem because people in different countries are using the same four character ideas. So they added this country code to make that happen less often. Why aren't I using the rapid orbits, the multi-GNSS orbits? Because I'm only doing GPS. So there's really no reason to translate the other data. So I'm running quick look, everything looks great. It looks very similar to the other site. Um, but yeah, are there trees? Yeah, there's some trees. They're not a lot of trees though. They look, I'm not sure how far away they are, but they're not super close. Um, 
We have the same problems with the way I parameterize the data, plus the satellite tracks being short uh, at these azimuth. I mean, the main difference you'll notice is um, instead of having empty spaces at the north, here the empty spaces are in the south. Um, Again, this is a site that is known to Nevada Reno, so I don't have to put in the lat long and height. I compute reflector height I, by running GNSSIR. I get a list of which tracks are available. Again, 40 tracks is great. Um, I compute phase, and then I try to compute volumetric water content. Um, and again, Here's an example, this green trace up in the top left, where, yeah, I see some changes when it, I believe it rained, but it's not as consistent as the others. And that's probably gonna uh, generate a large RMS. And sure enough, I, you know, I've got several warnings about things that should be removed that have high RMSs. If you have this many tracks, I would say, get rid of these. So again, you run it again, you change the warning value, and you say, get rid of it. Then you run it again. Looks a little better. Um, I, I fear that, you know, this is a class. So I'm trying to show you good and bad, that things aren't perfect. Uh, and I, I do have a lot of plots. But you don't look at plots all day long. I have to emphasize that. I did this because I wanted to show you what the good and the bad. But you don't look at plots all day long. You set parameters of quality control that warn you when things have to change. And if you're, and as you get better at it, you set it so it automatically fixes the problem. That's the way to do it. Um, you know, we never could have analyzed 150 stations if I had to look at pictures all day long. So you set up metrics that let you know if something's gone crazy, but otherwise you remove outliers as needed. And this is the final series. Um, I'm not sure uh, if people are asking these questions, but usually around this time, someone says they, they don't, well, people don't usually say they don't believe you, but they don't. So what you can do at that point is see if there's any in situ data nearby. Now, in the previous, you know, when I was talking to you, I was saying too many people compare snow sensors that aren't in the same place. Some are in trees, others are not. Um, and in this case, you've got the same problem um, in this Australian data set. I mean, I'm no expert on Australian soil moisture. But I Googled, you know, where the MET data for Australia. And sure enough, there is a soil moisture. I mean, this is the soil moisture site. Um, you can tell the difference between um, a geodesist and a hydrologist by the latitude and longitude digits right there. Um, we're giving out digits to a centimeter and they're giving out digits to I don't know what. Um, I'm not going to go there, but if any of you are interested in this, they've actually got data that tells you when it rained. So you can, I don't have soil moisture data for that site, maybe, but they do at the post office, apparently, and it even has the same name. It's called Mitchell. They can tell you when it rained. And so you can check to see if these uh, increases in um, soil moisture as measured by GPS uh, agree in terms of timing. And you also notice that they had a big amount of rain. Um, eh, well, you know, actually some of these are quite large in general, but these were all clumped together. So I will leave the interpretation for the hydrologist. Um, again, I'm happy to let you have the more advanced model, but you have to help. Uh, we used uh, min and max soil texture values and those are, can be entered in at the command line, but you are also, if you don't want to use those, you can make an in situ measurement and use those as your, you know, basically set the level of your data set. Because like I said, I'm measuring phase and converting it into volumetric water content. It's not by itself volumetric water content. Um, I did want to say that I personally 
find it very hard to trust uh, GPS data unless I know what receiver's running there. Not all receivers are the same. And um, so before we you know, move on from this code development, I want to set up a kind of a database where you can keep track of your, if you choose to use this software so that you can keep track of which softwares are running uh, at the site. And um, just so you're sure, right? That there's no different when they changed from Trimble to Septentrio. Um, and you might wanna say, well, I wanna treat those two series separately. That's fine. Um, the other thing I would say is just a point of, I'm not sure what to say, but it's, um, maybe it's just uh, common sense. One of the reasons people change equipment is because it goes bad. So sometimes uh, the reason you want to know that they changed the receiver is it kind of gives you some context for why results started looking funny. And sometimes it's because the receiver had started misbehaving. And the people that ran it knew that because the positions also looked bad. So there's a it's a good thing that they noticed it and changed it. But it it might lead you to just throw out those 30 days of data while the receiver was falling apart. Sometimes it's the antenna and not the receiver, but um, so I hope I'm not telling too many secrets by letting you know that GPS is not perfect. So that's pretty much all I had to say about soil moisture. That took about 35 minutes, which maybe I, so I didn't talk you all to death. But I am willing to answer questions now if, um, I guess about both parts if you like, um, but just snow and soil moisture um, would be the best. Christine, would you like me to pose a few more questions? You may. You may. Uh, there I'm was not a, gonna look. <laughs> there was a few ask, inquiring about the, the resolution of the SNR observations required to make either soil moisture or water retrievals or snow depth? Um, I prefer the quarter dB hertz or um, tenth of a dB hertz, which I think are pretty standard by a good receiver for soil moisture and snow. But uh, for water, I have to say, you can get you can get some pretty good results with one dB hertz, even though it's not preferred. <laughs> I don't want that, but um, sometimes that's all they have. Um, actually, there are lots of experts here. So let's open it up to them. What do you say for, um, what's the sweet spot of precision for uh, SNR data? All right, well, they're not answering, but um, I've told you what I think. Um, I, I think, uh, I think Trimble's now a tenth, isn't it, um, Tim? Oh, you I know? did see in the chat, Simon had addressed this. I don't know if he's, maybe he's no. occupied, but he says for water, he agrees with you, the water level estimation, it doesn't make much difference. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at some, for many sites, you're looking at big differences in the frequencies. And so, uh, you know, these things we're trying to do for soil moisture are so small. Uh, that you don't want to be fighting over uh, digitation issues, um, uh, or, you know, round off errors, if you will. And uh, snow depth as well is, uh, you know, it's a it's a geometric. It's the reflector height changes, and those can be like I showed over a meter. Of course, we're going to see some tides that are seven meters. So you know, it's uh, the irony is. You know, the signals that can be quite huge and uh, tight, but that actually makes them, you know, more interesting. But that's also hard because they change during the track, whereas that doesn't even come up with snow depth in soil moisture. We never worry about, well, in the 30 minutes that you were tracking that satellite or an hour, did it snow? Who cares? No one cares. It, it, it's it's going to be so small that you'll never see a change big enough to affect your results. But in tides, you can. 
and you have to correct for it. So, you know, they give you a bigger signal, but then that creates, you know, a need for better models. So. Yeah, and I don't, just to follow on, like you mentioned, you hinted at this, Christine, and I don't want to step on Thomas's toes because I think he's going to speak later about deploying new sites, but it's certainly, this is, for many receivers, this is a setting that you, you know, this is a parameter in the configuration, so it's certainly something to consider. Really? The wow. SNR uh, precision? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I know, and I'm not familiar, as some of this group is, with the low-cost sensors, but I suspect that's the case as well. So. I wouldn't... Um... I, I'm a big advocate for the low cost sensors for water level sensors and um, and even for snow, but I, I have never worked on them for soil moisture, so I can't tell you what to do. Um, so I've only worked on the um, these other ones. I mean, we looked at a lot of sites that were had very similar equipment. They were all choke rings. They were all the same antenna that everybody tells you won't give you any multipath effects. And but clearly, even the smallest soil moisture changes were quite easy to see. It's not the antenna that hurts you, it's the vegetation. And you always have to be careful. Uh, it, it's just something you need to have in your models. You cannot ignore it at all. Um, so it's it, it makes it challenging. Um, and you know, somebody asked what our error bar in the chat there for snow, and I said four centimeters. That's the snow depth accuracy value we have. Could it be better? Yes, but that's the value when we had two centimeters of SWE. For soil moisture, I think we were at like 0.038 or something, you know, 3.8%, uh, which was just good enough to be a validation method for SMAP, where the requested value was 4%. And our data sets were used in SMAP validation. And as far as I could tell, we were no worse than real soil moisture sensors. We weren't really better much better, but we were just as good as. So even though it had all these issues that made it difficult, including doing the leveling and soil texture, how do we set the zero value? Well, it turned out for validation, it was all that reset anyway, because they were assimilating five different kinds of soil moisture sensors. So they were very concerned with bias already. And so they would just take them out. So we spent a lot of time trying to do it right, but you know, at the end of the day, I guess we could have given them phase and they probably would have figured it out for us in retrospect. Um, I think it seems like a, I think maybe this is a, also followed on a little bit to Felipe spoke about yesterday with respect to remote sensing, but there's a few questions asking about the role of atmospheric conditions in these, in, in this particular signal extraction. Why? Why would this be any different than snow or uh, water levels? We're looking at the ground. Um, I, I don't, so are, so it's a question whether it makes a range change, is that? difference? Or? Yeah, I think the, the question is, is what is the effect of potential atmospheric conditions on the ability for, 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 or the variance, I'm assuming, in these reflector heights? It's minuscule. And the reason is it doesn't, that effect, which is huge for a geodesist. So geodesist, and that's how I was trained. We feared the troposphere. You know, it was a, you know, varied in time. It's used for atmospheric sensing. The questioner is absolutely correct. If you are trying to measure position, you want to remove every single bias that affects the distance between the antenna and the satellite, every single one. And if you could do them all to a millimeter, you would. And the troposphere is one of the hardest ones. So you're right to be fearful of it. But think about it, if the same wave is bouncing off um, soil, 
How much of that time is in the balance versus the 20,000 kilometers it took to get there, right? And actually, the atmospheric effect's only at the end, right? It's only at the troposphere. It's spending all its time, both the reflected and the direct signal, they're going through the same stuff. That extra little bounce is nothing for the atmosphere, for the atmosphere. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you about it's an effect. It's absolutely a fact. But uh, it's just not a concern for this application. Vegetation's the concern. It's the stuff on the it's the stuff growing in the soil that's your bigger problem. And there are some people that I mean, we were at one time going to try to see if we could tell when grass was dewy, right? When there was water on the grass, and I think we sent grad students out there at you know six a.m. try and measure that. I mean, I feel mean, like I was the mean thing I did, but. Uh, you know, by the end of it, we were working so hard just to keep up with these 150 stations that I guess we just gave up on that. Um, but I think you should be able to see when the vegetation's wet. And that's related to the atmospheric conditions, but it's not from going, it's not from the signal going through the air, I don't think. I mean, I'm not always right, but I don't think. I, I think that captures most of them. There's a few more we could answer directly, but um, as far as like these sort of higher level concepts, I think those are the, the big ones, unless uh, someone, anyone else, any of the other panelists have more questions. I, I, I don't, I mean, I am glad that we worked on soil moisture. I learned a lot. I think there's some value to some of these larger networks like Plate Boundary Observatory, which has changed its name. Now it's NOTA, let me see, Network of the Americas. Um, if you can partner with geodetic agencies to run networks um, with you or for you, because let's say they want the positions and you want soil moisture, if you can just convince them not to put it on a building, and put it in the field. I mean, those Australians were not trying to measure soil moisture. I can assure you, not a single site in the Plate Boundary Observatory was installed for me and my colleagues. But we sifted through them and found some that worked. They didn't all work. And um, I think I saw some pictures on the Slack channel of possible sites. Some of those should work great. It's really mostly you want planar surfaces, unless you want to use the more complicated vegetation model to be semi-arid uh, is best. Um, and, you know, just find partnerships because running equipment is expensive and um, time consuming. Things break, things have to, you have to have maintenance visits. If you have partners that want to do they, let's say they want to support surveyors. Let's say they want to support geophysics. Let's say they want to, I don't know, there's a million things people use GNSS for. Um, if they're not unwilling to put it out on a natural surface, I mean, it doesn't even have to be all 360 degrees of azimuth, 180 degrees. What if they just give you the southern quadrants or the northern quadrants? If they're willing to do that, then they will maintain the site. And you can take the benefit from that. I have used examples from existing networks because I no longer run sites. I did run sites when I was trying to develop these methods with my colleagues. It was a lot of work. And it's not fun. So I don't really, unless you have some great desire to run an instrument yourself, I don't really encourage you to do that unless you see a way, you know, this is what I want to do in my country. I want to measure soil moisture and this is the best way I can do it. And if that's true, that's great. But just be prepared that running networks is time consuming. Running any instrument is time consuming. You have to telemeter the data. Um, 
you have to make sure I had mice get into my instrument box. I had a fire in my instrument box. I had a receiver frozen because someone opened it to look at it and didn't lock it. I mean, every time you have someone visit your site, that's money that you have to pay to maintain your site. So, all right, it's off my soapbox. Can people raise their hands just to say they love soil moisture? Have I scared you off? I don't know. Well, as my husband says, you'll never get a bad teaching evaluation for ending your class early. So I'm all for stopping 10 minutes early if you don't have questions, but I'm also willing to answer a few more if you want to send them to um, the Q&A, I guess. You did get a few raised hands, so there are some Aww. soil moisture hands. Yay. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in the Western US, there's a network sitting right there that can be started, can be run right now. But it just, it you know, it depends whether you need it. Uh, I was when I was in Australia, I had a hydrologist tell me I don't need in situ data. I've got SMAP. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> so, OK, I mean, I wasn't going to argue with them. I'm not a hydrologist. Um, but, you know, there's interest, you know, South America might be a great place to deploy it. In some regions. Um, and. Um, for snow. There are sites that I know of in the Western US. I, I, I don't know the rest of the world as well um, in terms of snow. All right. OK, so I'm going to go have dinner. <laughs> Seven o'clock here. And um, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Uh, I'm really excited that you'll get to hear from Simon Williams as well as David Purnell. Um, Purnell sorry, I mispronounced that. And hopefully Felipe will be online too. He also does tides. Um, and, and then um, Thomas will be talking on Friday uh, along with me. And also uh, Tim is gonna talk on Friday. And Simon's gonna talk about cheap, his cheap sensor work. So uh, good night to everybody or good afternoon to people in the US or good morning. <laughs> Talk to you later, bye.